hit record. So. I'll still leave it up in case it does. But otherwise, I'll just upload it later. All right, uh, do you believe whatever you're ready? All right, sir. <clears throat> Good morning. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to do a scripture in the prayer. And we're going to uh, go to the Word of God with Pastor. Amen? Amen. Amen. You want the light? Yes, sir. Please, sir. Good morning once again, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank God for just allowing us to see this day, a day mm -hmm. which we've never seen before. And we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. 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 I'm going to be reading scripture. John, the 14th chapter. John, the 14th chapter. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are men and mansion. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The word of God to the people of God. Amen. 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 Let us bow our head in prayer. <clears throat> Father, it's once again that we have come before you, throne of grace. And God, we come humbly and boldly as we know how, God. And God, we just come, Father, just giving you thanks, giving you honor, and giving you praise, oh God, for just this day, oh God. Yes. God, we thank you, oh God, for keeping us another day, oh God. Yes. But God, most of all, we confess our sins before thee, oh God. Yes. The Lord. things that we have done, said, and thought in deeds, oh God. For God, we know that you are forgiving God, oh God. Yes. And God, we know that you will forgive us, oh God. And for that, God, we just want to tell you, thank you. Thank God. you, Lord. But God, we thank you, God, for just holding us in the palm of your hand, oh God. Yes. To see another day, oh God. Thank you. But God, while we slumbered and slept, God, when we even didn't know we was in the world, oh God, you watched over us. Oh thank God. you, Lord. Amen. And for God, we just want to tell you, thank you, God. Thank you. We give you glory and praise just for that, oh God. Thank you. And God, uh, we thank you, oh God, for those that are sick and shut in, oh God. Yes, Lord. God, that some may be shut in and this, I mean sick in this uh, congregation, oh God. Yes, Lord. But God, we just thank you for them anyway, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. God, I'm not going to ask you to go because you already there, oh God. Yes, Lord. God, you already know who are, they are, oh God. Yes. And for that, God, I just tell you, thank you, God. Thank you. God, I give you glory and I give you praise, oh God. Yes. And God, I thank you, oh God, for allowing us to come to this house and worship. Just one more time, oh Thank God. Thank you, Lord. Yes. We'll give you all them praise and glory for that, oh God. Oh God, there's some that desire to be here, oh God. Yes. They can't be here, oh God. Yes. But God, you made it uh, possible for us to be here, oh God. Thank you, Lord. And for that, God, I just want to tell you thank you, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. And God, as we begin to go into the word of God, oh God, we ask, oh God, that you would give the congregation, oh God, each and every one of us, oh God, an itching ear, oh God, that we will have a desire to hear your word, oh God. And God, that we only not have a desire, but we have a desire to do your will, oh God. Yes, Lord. And for yes. that, God, we just want to tell you thank you. Thank God. you. Yes. For you are, you are forever in a, a praising God, oh God. Yes, Lord. And we just want to tell you thank you, Thank God. you, Jesus. God, we ask, oh God, that you will anoint the pastor, oh God. Please, Lord. As he stands behind your pulpit, oh God. Yes, Jesus. God, we ask that you give him wisdom, knowledge, and from up on high, oh God. Right now, Lord. God, let him, oh God, not say what he wants to say, oh God, but give him your word, oh God. Yes, yes. Jesus. To your people, oh God. Yes. yes. And God, all these blessings we're asking right now, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, Jesus. we pray. Name. And let us all say amen. 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 And amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Since I lay my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah, since I lay my burdens down, friends don't treat me 
like they used to since I laid my burden down. Friends don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burden down. Burden down, Lord. Burden down, Lord. Since I laid my burden down, burden down, Lord. Burden down, Lord. Since I laid my burden down. Every round goes higher and higher since I laid my burden down. Every round goes higher and higher since I laid my burden down. I feel better, so much better, since I laid my burden down. I feel better, so much better, since I laid my burden down. I'm going home to live with Jesus since I laid my burden down. I'm going home to live with Jesus since I laid my Service, and we're going to turn it over to the hands of the pool. Okay. Amen. 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 Bless your thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. God is good. He is good. God is great and greatly to be praised. I think so I like to say. He's good. He really is. He really is good. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. It is so good to see you this morning. I know it's cold and it's wet and it's foggy outside, but I thank I thank you for pressing your way here. Amen. It's, uh, I told Deacon Woods, I said, we'll see how it goes. If it's just if it's just the two of us, three of us, four of us, but look how the Lord has provided right. even more. We got a whole. Hey, you know what? That'd be all right with me. That's all right. But I am grateful. Uh, I'm grateful to be here with you. I want to give you, in the way of announcements, uh, Sister Elnora reached out to the Woods family and wanted everybody to know she is cancer-free. Amen. She is cancer-free and happy about it, surrounded by family, and just wants, and I just think it's important sometimes that we know that the prayers of the righteous availeth much, I believe, one passage said, so she is doing real well and glad. I think if you didn't hear it, Deacon Alexander's sister, Elnora, said she's cancer-free. She right. is cancer-free. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Y'all continue lifting her from prayer. Oh, yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. of course, still lifting up the Alexander family. who was with them yesterday for the homegoing of uh, Tina. It was a beautiful service. Deacon Alexander set the tone with yeah. prayer from the beginning. We couldn't do nothing but <laughs> praise the Lord. Right. I was crying by the time he got through Father God the first time. I was already a well of water, but it was wonderful, just a beautiful day. Hey, that's what they say, we had church now. We could have church after that, it was really, really beautiful. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you who called and reached out to them, sent texts, and checked on them. The Bible says that we ought to uh, celebrate with those who celebrate, mourn with those who mourn. Amen. And uh, part of being a family of believers is that we, we're there for each other. So when somebody's promoted, I'm, we're there for you to cheer you on. I'm not hating on your promotion. I'm glad about it. Right. Not because I'm expecting anything, but because I'm glad that somebody, that God is in the blessing business. Yeah. 
Amen. I don't I don't just I don't just get excited for you because I need something for me. I'm excited for you because I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Because God loves you. He loved you so much he thought you were worth dying for. So who am I to be mad when you when good stuff happened to you? Amen. Amen. And when things go wrong in your life, I can't look past you, look over you, ignore you, because when you hurt, I hurt. And I love that about this family we call New Mount Zion, because we, we really do mourn together and we really do rejoice together. Amen. Praise God. And we need both of them, don't we? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. uh, today, I got a, a, I know the last few weeks I've been staying and there's some tough ones. We've been rolling tussing and castor oil messages all month. <laughs> But we're gonna, we're gonna be there. <laughs> it ain't good for you. You may not want it, but you go. We got, we gotta have it. We gotta have it. And um, I got another one like that today. Wow. Amen. But I think you'll like this one. I think you will because it, it. We, you know, we've been doing what the Bible doesn't say all month, and this is our fourth one. We got a fifth Sunday. We won't be in here fifth Sunday. We'll be watching distance. But I got another one for next Sunday. But this Sunday. I am taking on, we are taking on, the Bible will help us to disprove and completely debunk the myth that if you don't give money to the church, you're cursed. Mm. Now, I don't think I have to do a, a show of hands or nothing to ask if anybody has ever heard that if you don't give money, whether it's tithes, offerings, seeds, first fruit, something, something you got to give to the church mm -hmm. or you are cursed. And if you want money, then you give money to the church, and you're supposed to get a, a, a big return on it, right? Wow. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Right. Praise the Lord that the Bible does not support the notion that God can be bought or sold. Mm -hmm. mm. So since the Bible doesn't teach us that, I don't even have to ask why people are saying it, because I know why people are saying it. We're going to talk about that too. And as I was preparing this lesson and doing research on, uh, on how we got to this place where the church, because if you talk to people who have been in church and left, one of the number one complaints that people have about why I left church is that they got tired of having all their money taken and having nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. Or they got tired of, of seeing that, that, that church seemed to be about making one person rich no matter what it cost everybody else. And they thought, is that really the God of this house? And of course it isn't. Amen. Praise the Lord. It isn't. Amen. But that doesn't mean that we aren't responsible for that perception. All right? So we wanna, I want to deal with that as, as, as uh, soundly and, and succinctly as I can this morning. Um, just bow your head for just a minute. Lord, speak. If you speak, we'll be all right. God, you are already good. Your word is already perfect. And you said that your word never returns to you void, but it always accomplishes what you set out for it to do. So we just surrender to you, Father God. Speak with my mouth, Father God. Talk for me, Lord God. Let your spirit uh, well up in me and, and say, what, uh, say what you want to say, Lord God. Take out anything that's not that you don't want said and add anything that you do. To the end that somebody would be saved today, even as we, as we take apart these worldly uh, interpretations of Scripture, Lord. Let somebody hear your word and want to be closer to you. Even in this, Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I, I know as, I, as I'm getting ready to talk about uh, the myth of giving money to the church means you're going to be rich. Because, I, again, I will say that is a myth. Mm. Amen. It may be strange hearing that coming from the pulpit, perhaps, maybe because it's 2023 and that's not something that I'm used to hearing. But I need you to know that um, there is no biblical mandate on how much you give to God. Mm. There isn't one. And I've got a bunch of scriptures that I'm going to go through to prove that to you. Um, my goal as your pastor, my assignment as your shepherd, is not to make sure that the flock is physically wealthy. Mm -hmm. If it were, then every pastor in the world is a failure. Mm -hmm. Because in many cases... The only person who's doing very well is the pastor and the people sitting on the first couple of rows. Mm -hmm. Amen, somebody else. Amen. So it is not the charge of a leader, of a pastor. I'm not just casting a vision so that we can all get behind it and everybody can run around the church seven times and holler Jericho and then all of our bills get paid. You do that, your credit score will fall very quickly mm -hmm. if that's how you think your bills will get paid. Uh, I'm not trying to get rich from your struggles is what I'm saying. Amen. 
Um, my heart is in serving God, and I'm doing what I do because I have love for you and passion for teaching the word of God to you. And I love you too much to lie to you, even if it might benefit me physically, financially, temporally, because I have to answer to God for what I tell his people. The Bible says that it, that it is a good thing that people should teach it, but not many should because they have even greater scrutiny on themselves. I get that. That's a real thing. And as I was preparing, even a few years ago, you know, that first that first Sunday I was coming in here in February of 2020, I was sitting here thinking, Lord, you've got to do this because I don't, I, 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 I can't. Mm -hmm. This isn't about me. And it's still not about me. But it shouldn't be strange to hear someone who is standing in the place to talk about Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Messiah, and say, this is not all about how you're going to give me stuff. That should be pretty normal to hear from the pulpit. Unfortunately, in 2023, it just isn't. You can't turn on TV and I don't care if they preach the house down. It always ends with, now if you want to seal this word. All right. Amen. Y'all don't got to sing us this morning. I know it's true. I, I, I've been to so many services where I feel like I was, we were in the midst of something beautiful happening. We're hearing from God and it really felt real. The music was going good and it was the good was getting gooder. And then they said, now you really want to seal that? This is the $1,000 line. This is the $200 line. This is whatever you got in your pocket line. And I'm like, dog, man, that don't seem right. Mm. It just never sat well with me because it seemed like there was this perception that in order to receive the blessings, the grace, the mercy, the favor of an all-powerful God, I somehow had to work through his middleman in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And that just don't sit well with me. All right. Then I got to the pulpit and I started searching the scriptures and I realized ain't nothing in here that says nothing about if you give me a bunch of stuff, God is going to give you anything. Come on. So when we started thinking about how are we going to uh, upgrade the sanctuary, and I was like, let's get a new building. Let's do it. That's God going to provide. And I was like looking around at all these other folks that had these big buildings and these big budgets. And I couldn't find a single solitary scripture that told me I have the right as a pastor to shackle you with a 30-year mortgage that I know I can't pay by myself. Right. I looked, Paul and them was going to church in caves and stuff. Nobody needed to sow a faith seed to keep the cave going. So where did that come from? Why is it so popular? Why are people saying this so much? Why are people buying into it? Well, I, I started looking around and listening like I do. You know, I like calling some of these frogs out, so y'all just hold on. If I, say something about you, if I say something about your favorite preacher, it is what it is. Preffle Dollar made waves last year. Uh, he put out a message. If you, if you follow him, you probably saw it. He said, I want to say that I've been wrong about tithing my whole career. If, I got, if you got any, any of my books or videos or sermons, throw them all away unless they match up with this. And then he went on to say that tithing is not biblical for the New Testament believer, which is true. I'm going to get to that. But then he went on to say, but you ought to give more than the tithe. If you want God to bless you, you got to give till it hurts. You shouldn't be giving from your savings account. You should be giving from your grocery money. So he went even further. He said, he said in an interview that he, that he wished he could line up all the people who don't tithe in his church and shoot them with a machine gun, lay them down in the ground behind the church, and then they could go and have church. Just look it up. I mean, just look it up. Go on YouTube and type Preflo Dollar shoots people who don't pay tithes. And you can listen to it for yourself. He said they should be given till it hurts from their grocery money. But Creflo Dollar, uh, and he said you should be trusting God that if you sow a seed, he said, because some prayers only respond to seed sowing, not just to praise and worship. But when it, contained, when it came time for Kerfell Dollar to buy a $65,000 top-of-the-line private jet that nobody in the congregation could fly on, he didn't praise God and wait for the miracle. He made the congregation feel guilty until they paid for it. Mm. <laughs> Jesus came to Jerusalem and said he rode in on a donkey. Amen. <laughs> okay. Amen. Benny Hinn said, and I quote, God will begin to prosper you for money always follows righteousness. Faith looks beyond the walls of the obstacle and on to the answer. Poverty, he says, comes from hell. Prosperity comes from heaven. So Benny Hinn wants you to think that if you're broke, you're living hellish. 
that if you're not rich, you're living a satanic life. While he is going on these crusades, we talked about it last week, remember? He goes on these crusades, leaves with $100,000 in cash, told people they're cured of cancer, and never follows up with them a day in his life. T.D. Jake said this, God, I'm going to say it like T.D. God is a businessman. He's not going to do business with someone who shows no sign of potential return. He invests in people who demonstrate an ability to handle what he's given them. T.D. Jakes makes it a, a production of extravagant giving, talking about walking around and get ready, get ready, get ready. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. You just got to claim it. It's already in your future. You just got to say it and have it and you will receive it. Somebody's going to have it today in the name of Jesus. And then they have an offering that lasts for a half hour. <laughs> and then they make sure. And everywhere he goes to preach, he charges between fifty dollars and $100,000 to preach a sermon there. You mean you don't just trust God is going to do it? Because you've given it, now he's going to give it to you. And God's going to do it because I'm a good businessman. But how come that don't work for the 99.9% the .9 of the world that's listening to this foolishness coming from the pulpit? Hmm. Joyce Meyer says, whatever you give up now will come back to you 100-fold in this lifetime. If that were true, then there should be no need for the church to ever ask anybody for anything. Again, Joyce Meyer, who charges thousands of dollars to go and talk places, says that if you want a return on your investment, you've got to give me money. <laughs> she said, if you want everything that God has for you, then I encourage you to ask him to help you live generously. How many of you have heard stuff like that? How many of you have heard the financial proclamations of Leroy Thompson? Money cometh to me. Now, he got a book called that. He even said cometh because it sounds like King Jamesy. <laughs> oh, Ashley and I were watching one of his sermons. I really make, I really drag her through this while I'm preparing my messages. And he, uh, he danced around on the altar on the money that people put on it. Said, let me get some anointing on this money. And people kept, as he was preaching, they were just putting money up on the altar. I've never seen anything look more pagan in my life. People came to Jesus, he gave them food, he gave them healing, he gave them, he gave them forgiveness, he gave them salvation. And they had, a, they had a, a, a collection box that they used to help support the ministry, but Jesus wasn't, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. It is ungodly to think that you are giving money to God in expectation of getting a return. Amen. Amen. It's wrong to think that I am not worshiping God in spirit or in truth, but I am doing what I'm doing because I expect something from him. Because if you do something with an expectation that the person is going to do it for you, and that's the only reason when you don't get what you want, your service will also deteriorate. But in relationships that matter, it's not always 50-50. Me and my wife, if she don't got but five, I got to come up with the other 95. I can't be in the house and be like, now nah, I'm going to sow my little seed of one and I'm expecting a hundredfold return on our relationship, on my investment because you love me. That don't mean she got to do that. All right. You would probably tell me I was a selfish husband if I said that I intended to give up 1% effort and expect a hundred from her. Right. Even if she loves me and wanted to do it, that would be putting her in a bind. It wouldn't be showing her love, care. It would be like we're not even in a relationship. It's disrespectful to trivialize God in this way. And I don't care if they call it an offering, a tithe, a seed, or first fruits, or a faith seed, or, a, uh, or, or, or give till it hurts, or they holler, or they yell, or they shout, or they guilt trip you. It is never right to turn what God has given freely to the world mm -hmm. in his son Jesus into a business. Mm. Don't buy into the con. And at New Mount Zion, as long as I'm here and have anything to say about it, there won't be nobody here darkening this pulpit who speaks otherwise. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody going to come here and pronounce a blessing, demand a payment, and then walk out of here and not care about you. Because, you know, Jesus was God. He is God. And when he was in the, in the world, everybody he touched, he knew. Everybody he saw, he created. And Jesus is qualified to follow up and know the difference. Tithing is an Old Testament concept. Let's start with tithing. Because that's the first one that people get, uh, get real serious about. Um, people, I think uh, Benny Hinn said that, that tithing is what opens up the windows of heaven. Oh. That sound familiar? Yeah. Get ready. Go ahead and get your Bible. Get ready. Get ready for uh, Malachi 3. I'm coming to you. I have them on the, I don't think that the broadcast is streaming like it's supposed to. Um, I don't think it is. It was, yeah, it's acting crazy. But I got it recorded, so I'll put this online afterwards. Um, so, tithing is an Old Testament concept. When I say it's an Old Testament concept, I mean that it is among the 613 Levitical laws. Amen? Amen. Now, I know this may be different than what you've heard because it's different than what I grew up hearing. So y'all just got to roll with me and keep your Bibles open so you're not even trusting me on it. You are checking for yourselves. Right. So go ahead and put a finger in Malachi 3 and let me set this up for you. In, uh, if there's a few places, and I can get these to you afterwards if you need them, the tithe was never money in the Bible. Ever. Ever. In the New Testament or the Old Testament, the tithe was never money. Did you know that? Tithing is an Old Testament concept, and it was where the Israelites, who owned land, gave 10% of the crops and the animals that they raised to support the Levitical priests because they weren't allowed to work. Check Leviticus 16 if you don't believe me. And they didn't just give 10%. So if all these folks were telling you, if you don't give me 10%, then you are blah, 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 blah. They gave 10% for the Levitical priest. They gave another 10% for the, uh, for the poor. And then they gave a third tithe every three years for the upkeep of the temple. 23%-ish. Now, do you want to buy into that? I don't. <laughs> I've heard people say, well, you know, it all belongs to God, so uh, yeah, I guess I'll do well with the 90, or in this case, I suppose the 77% the 70, the that I have left. Oh, yeah. The problem with tithing from a New Testament standpoint is how do you get that tithe to God? Mm -hmm. Because there are thousands of churches within a hundred mile radius of here, thousands of churches. You mean to tell me every single one of those churches is a mediator that will get the money to God. So that means that you can start church tomorrow at your house. Does that mean that you can require that these people give you 10% of their income? You call yourself a pastor? So then how does that get set up? Well, in the Old Testament, there was nobody who was setting up shop in their house. There was one place at the time left. And it was to the temple, which was a physical building in Jerusalem that required maintenance. And it had priests that worked there day and night. Well, since the year 70, 70, 70 AD, there ain't been no temple because the Romans tore it down, burned it down to the foundation. Now, from an Old Testament standpoint, because it is an Old Testament law, you can't even tithe according to the Old Testament because the laws are such that you got to follow them perfectly or you're not following them at all. Wow. Has anybody ever taken their money to Jerusalem and laid it at the foundation of the temple? Then you have never tithed in your life. <laughs> but the tithe was never money anyway. Leviticus 16 says that, if, that you got to take your 10% of your crops and your animals. Now, why would I take my crops and my animals to the temple instead of my money? Because the temple don't need your money to run. The temple needed something that people could eat. And when they would have festivals and they had people who didn't have land and didn't have animals, they would go there and guess what they would eat when they had the festival? The tithe. And they would have like a barbecue. And they would get all those animals and all that food out of the storehouse and everybody would eat. Nobody had to pay for anything. Unless you were a landowner or someone who raised animals, 
you didn't even have to worry about giving a tithe because the tithe was never money. Blowing y'all minds yet? So, how did we get to the to the tithe being money? Uh, all you gotta do is, is go to Europe and look around at these gigantic cathedrals. They look like they cost about a grillion dollars. Uh, because around the 1600s, 1700s, all of these archbishops and archdukes and so and so of Canterbury and all the popes and the and the priests that realized that they could that they were missing out on a on a business opportunity. They had all these people who were doing whatever they told them to do. They started telling them that we want to build an edifice for the Lord. So the tithe we believe now can be called money, and you should give it to the church. And since then, at the hands of mostly Roman Catholics, the tithe became money. But for the previous 1,700 years, even all the way back to the Old Testament, so uh, another 3,000 years back to that, it was never money. Ever. Until a man decided that it was a good way to monetize the believers in Jesus Christ. Now, I just want you to look around again. Have you ever met a Levitical priest? Somebody who doesn't have a job can't support himself, and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, working at the temple. I've never seen one. You know why? Because it ain't none. There's no temple. There's no ceremonies. There's no storehouse. So according to the Old Testament, not like God honors you halfway following the law. So even if you wanted to be a stickler in following the law, first you need to be Jewish. Second, you need to be in Jerusalem. Third, you'd be given to the temple. And there's got to be food. Anybody have enough land that you're growing crops on and you got enough animals that you can, be, that you can do that? Then it ain't even about you anyway. Well, why is T, then why T.D. Jakes and Crystal be bilking you for that 10%? It's almost like they wanted for this. So Malachi 3 and 10 is one of the places in the Bible where, 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 these, uh, where these prosperity uh, preachers like to try, to try to pimp you for money. And it's a big one. And it's been the calling card for demanding money from people. And I want to read it to you. If, if you caught the message um, on Wednesday, you heard me talk a little bit about this already. But notice that what, what, uh, what false teachers do a whole lot of times is they'll read you a verse or a part of a verse and pretend like it doesn't happen in the context of the chapter. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, uh, it, well, verse 8 of, of Malachi 3 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? Anybody ever been, uh, been accused of being a robber in church? You're not a robber unless you're a robber. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? God says, In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And then Malachi 3 and 10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Mm -hmm. Try me and know this. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and I'll see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. Now rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Mm -hmm. All that agricultural talk what happens is there's a hustle, there's a scam, there's a scheme. And I'm gonna hit you to it. If you're a prosperity pimp, just be mad at me right now. Right. So I'm about to let everybody know about your scam. Here's how they has they twist this scripture and make it about money. The first thing they say is that bringing the tithe is money. That's the first lie. Because the tithe was always animals and crops. If you couldn't get, and if you check Leviticus 16, if you couldn't afford to get your animals and your crops there, you could buy the, you could change them in for the right, for the right amount of money. But when you got to the temple, you had to go and buy the crops and the animals to take to the temple because they didn't need your money. You defile the altar of God by putting money on it because the only thing that God accepts for the forgiveness of sins, for your atonement, for your justification is what? What do they put on the altar to forgive my sins? Help me out. Blood. 
On the Day of Atonement, what did they do to make sure that, the, that our sins were forgiven? A spotless lamb had to be laid on the altar. You know how disrespectful you would be if you went to the Temple of Jerusalem where there was only a place that only the priest could go for the Holy of Holies on a specific day and you just strive out five or ten dollars? How disrespectful you look. But, the, but these lines will tell you, they bring a tithe. And they're, like, they're going to twist it like this. Listen, they're going to say, you robbed God. Because you haven't given your tithe to me. I'm not God. I promise. I checked. Even though Crepto said we little guys. We not. And you giving me stuff is not going to make you any closer to God. Uh, it isn't. It isn't. And they say you got to return your tithe. It's not even yours. You're not even paying it. You're returning it. It doesn't even belong to you. In the first line. Then it says that uh, your church is the storehouse. So they don't say nothing about no church here because this is about 500 years before Jesus lived and there wasn't no churches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only place that they went to worship was the temple. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't no churches. It was just the one place. Because now I'd be confused. Do I need to take my money to God over here? Or should I take it down to this church down the road? What if I'm away? If I take it to the church I'm visiting at, is that getting it to God? Does it, do I need to FedEx it home? Or how do I get it there? Well, it's obvious to the Jews because they physically took stuff there and watched people eat it. So your church is a storehouse. There's a second lie. No thing. What's the storehouse? A storehouse. And what's in it? Food. So don't buy it. Don't, don't listen to nobody telling you that, the store, that this is the storehouse. It ain't. It's not. We got a fridge back there just some water and stuff in there, mostly ketchup and, and mustard and stuff. <laughs> we're not a storehouse right. we're a place that people come together to gather to hear the word of God explained not a storehouse not a temple and it says and what they say is you bring the tithe to the storehouse so there may be food or meat in my house and they say well that means money the food, the meat, that's the money but it isn't because the tithe was never money so it can't be that are talking about money. And then he says, but if you do, I'll open the windows of heaven. Uh -huh. Pour you out a blessing. This is how they, 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 the, these, these prosperity preachers know how to twist your guilt a little bit. Because they know that we're sinful. They know that we just greedy as they are. We just don't have a platform to rob people. Right. So they just make you think, all right, well, if I can't get it from anybody, I can't get it until I start my own little church. And bilk everybody for their money. Now I can at least at least I can extort God by giving ten percent to Him. He's gonna give me more than I have room to receive. Now we're talking about money. Mm -hmm. Has anybody's bank ever called them? Anybody who's ever paid tithes in their life? Has your bank ever called you and said you have there's too much money coming into your account? <laughs> you don't have room to receive that. No. I don't think they said that to Bill Gates. I don't think they said Steve Jobs. I don't think they said it to. To, to, to Mark Zuckerberg or to or even to Elon Musk, richest man in the world. Banks somehow always have room to receive what you take to them. So if this is money, that don't make no sense. And it would be a lie. And we know that God is not a man that he should lie. It only makes sense if it's something physical that fits in a physical space that can overflow. So no, Meat ain't money. Meat is meat. All right. And you say, well, God promised if you give money to the church, you have more than you have room to receive. That's not true. So let's talk about the truth of Malachi 3 as we, as we press on. It's going to be, it's, I, I'm just trying to set you free, y'all. I'm just trying to tell you some truth. Malachi 3 is speaking to Jewish priests, not to the Jewish people. Because remember, only a, a small number of the people could even give a tithe. Let much less be called a robber for it. So how do you rob a place? How, what, what happens when you rob some place? You go without stuff, and then you go to a place where the stuff is, and then you take it by force. That's robbery. Uh -huh. So how do you rob the tithe? If you go to Nehemiah chapter 13, I know I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures today. They're all on the slide, on the they're on the, uh, the way you call it. If you go, we'll get this up uh, afterwards and there'll be, a bunch of these are going to be listed. But in Nehemiah 13, 
the priests raided the storehouse. They took the food that was supposed to be for the people and they set it aside for somebody who they thought could treat them kindly. They took the money that was set aside for the people of God and they gave it to a friend of theirs. Let me read to you a little bit from Nehemiah chapter 13. Mm -hmm. Because there's a situation where people took the tithe physically out of the storehouse. And it wasn't money. Mm. Nehemiah 13. says, now before this, Eliashib, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of God, was allied with Tobiah. And he prepared for him, Eli Eliashib, who's the priest, prepared for his friend Tobiah a storehouse, a large room where they had stored the grain offerings, frankincense, articles, the new wine and oil, which they were commanded to give to the Levites, right? Because the tithe is food you give to people that aren't allowed to work. Uh -huh. And singers and gatekeepers and the offerings of the priests. But during all this, this is Nehemiah distancing himself from it. <laughs> he says, Verse 6, during all this, I was not in Jerusalem <laughs> for the 32nd year of, Ar of Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon. I had returned to the king. He's like, I was not around for this. Don't blame it on me. He says, then certain days I obtained leave from the king and I came to Jerusalem and discovered that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms and brought back to them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also realized, verse 10, that the portions for the Levites had not been given to them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. And he says, so I, con I contended with the ruler, and I said, why have the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place, and then all of Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shemaliah, yeah, Sh uh, Shelemiah, the priest of Zadok, and the scribes, Levites, Pediah, and he, so he set people up to keep watch over the storehouse. Y'all see that in Nehemiah 13? Oh, yeah. So what happened, and this is the, and Nehemiah is speaking right as they're building the second temple, so is Malachi. Remember we were reading through the Old Testament of Minor Prophets last year, and we were right around the second temple being built. Malachi is in that same time frame. So there's overlap here. So somebody went into the place where the food was set aside for the Levites and the poor people, and they took it out and set it aside for their rich buddy. They robbed God. So when we go back to Malachi, now that we got some sense and some context, <laughs> now I can go back to Malachi and know that God is talking to the priests. And listen to what he says. Malachi 3 and 8. Now we got a little bit, now that we understand, he says, will a man rob God? If you rob me, but you say in what way have we robbed you? He says in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. Priest mm -hmm. who took the stuff and set it aside in a room for their friend. Mm -hmm. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Mm -hmm. Robbed the whole nation. And then he says, bring all the tithes to the storehouse so that there'll be food in my house. And try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room to receive it. I said, get the stuff out of that dude's house and put the, put the food back where it's supposed to be and I'll bless you so that everybody will have plenty. All right. And then he says, and I will rebuke the devourer. The devourer is a Hebrew word that often refers to locusts. The devourer ain't Satan who's gonna come and take your money if you don't give it to me. It's a locust who will eat up your food and your stuff. He says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Also, not money. 
Does that make sense? Amen. Some of y'all sitting there looking mad. I can't believe they did me like that. I know. I know. Me too. But I want you to have some truth in here. It is a lie from the devil that that you got to monetize what God gave us for free in Christ Jesus. But did Abraham time? That's the other lie they tell you. In Genesis 14, Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek. That was even before the law, so you should be tithing based on that. First thing, Abraham had a big battle. And he gave the spoils of that battle to Melchizedek, who was called the king of Salem and a priest of God. Now, how is he a priest of God before there's a temple of God? Mm -hmm. Well, Hebrews goes on and tells us that Jesus is a priest in the line of Melchizedek. Hmm. I wonder if Melchizedek was Jesus kind of showing up in the Old Testament. And accept, who accepts worship and who accepts offerings? Except God. So the only way that Abraham tithing would be if you went out and you uh, conquered a, a, a country. And then you gave 10% of that to him. But that wasn't nobody's money that they were just giving every on a regular interval to a, to a church organization that can't afford to support itself. <sighs> Y'all all right? Oh, yeah. Let me give you one more. That they love to, this is a good one for folks who are hurting real bad, that they make, that they make you feel bad. In Luke 21, we have the story of the widow's might. Y'all ever heard this one? I don't know you have, man. Don't be mad at me. I'm just trying to set you free. And, and uh, it's in Luke 21, uh, near the end of Luke 21, I believe. Uh, no, no, Luke, it's, it's at the beginning of Luke 21. Yeah. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. Mm -hmm. And he saw also a certain poor widow put in two mites. That's like a penny. And he looked up. And Jesus says, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all of the rest. Mm -hmm. For all of these gave out of their abundance in the offerings of God, but she gave out of her poverty and put all of her livelihood that she had. Has a preacher ever told you, so you got to give till it hurts? Mm -hmm. She didn't have nothing, so she gave. Mm -hmm. There's two things I want to point out to you. First thing is that Jesus does not praise the woman for this. He just says that's what happened. He doesn't say that's good. Everybody put a pen in that and do like that. You notice that? Mm -hmm. Just because the Bible says something doesn't mean that it is telling you it's a good idea to do. David killed his, uh, killed, killed one of his soldiers, uh, forced his wife to have sex with him, move in with him, and later marry him. That don't mean you should do that. So Jesus never says this is a good thing. Do you like context? I like context. Sometimes they put the um, they put these chapter and verse numbers in there, and you forget that there's something happening around it. If you go back just a few verses to uh, Luke twenty and forty five, which is part of the same conversation Jesus is having, he says, "Then in the hearing of all the people." He said to his disciples, beware the scribes who desire to go around in long rows. They love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. The very next verse, and he looked and he saw the rich putting their wealth into the offering box and a woman putting a penny in and she didn't have nothing and he said she's given more than that Jesus is commenting on a broken predatory financial system that's supposed to be the temple of God he ain't saying this is what you ought to do because right after that right after this he said that about the woman he, as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with such beautiful stones and donations. Jesus said, these things which you see, the days which will come, not one stone shall be left and upon another that will be thrown down. So sandwiched between Jesus saying, this place is crooked and I'm going to tear this place down 
he sees someone giving all they have who ain't got nothing. Does that sound like he's complimenting her? Jesus is lamenting about what's going on in his father's house. When he saw people money changing and selling animals in the court of the temple, he ran about with a bowl with and said, my father's house should be a house of prayer, but you have turned into a den of thieves. And he's sitting in there watching this. But according to the Old Testament law, that woman shouldn't have been given anything to the temple. Because why do they have food at the temple in the storerooms? For poor people. All right. So she should have been able to go and find support at the church, at the temple. All right. Not a place to put her penny. Somebody should have stopped her and said, no, baby, put your penny back in your pocket. I've got all this that I'm putting in the offering. I want everybody to see me because I'm nice with it. So I'm in the thousand dollar line. If I put it on American Express, no, here, keep your money. We will help. Deuteronomy 15 and 7 says, if there is a poor person among you, this is the law. If there's a poor person among you, one of your brothers in the city gates and the land of the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Instead, you ought to open your hand to him and freely loan him enough for whatever he, has, he needs. Be careful that it is not wicked in your heart and forgive it every seven years. He will cry out to the Lord against you and you'll be guilty. Give it to him. Don't have a stingy heart when you give because the Lord will bless you in all your work and in everything you do. And you will never cease. He said, for there will never cease to be poor people in the land. That is why I'm commanding you, open your hand willingly to the poor and needy brother in your land. So these folks are sauntering around dropping all kinds of money in the offering plates so everybody can see how much they're giving. While there's someone who is among them who can't support herself because she's a widow, she's older, and she's starving, and she feels pressure to put what she doesn't have in the offering plate. And Jesus said, I'm about to tear this thing down. Mm -hmm. So don't let nobody tell you you gotta give till it hurt. Give out your grocery money. Don't ever give me your rent. Don't ever give, don't ever put your rent money in the, in the offering plate. I praise God that, that we have what we need to keep the lights on, but the lights ought not be off of your house and on at the church. Mm -hmm. If it's that serious, you need to be texting me or one of the deacons and saying, I'm struggling. That's what we're here for. We're not here to be a city set on a hill that is outwardly like Jesus said in Matthew 23. He said that the Pharisees and the scribes, everybody who's running this scam, he said, y'all are like whitewashed tombs. You're pretty on the outside, dead on the inside. He said, you're like, you take the cup and you wash the outside, but the inside is filthy. Mm -hmm. yeah, that wasn't no compliment of that system. So don't worry about it. I know Luke 6, they give, give, and this should be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. You know what that's talking about? Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. Wasn't Jesus rich? Prosperity pimps will tell you that Jesus was rich. No, he was not. Her father was a carpenter. Carpenters didn't make a whole lot of money. And in Luke 2 and 24, Joseph and Mary gave two turtle doves at Jesus' dedication. Two turtle doves, two little bitty birds. According to Leviticus 12, the only people who could give that small of an offering were poor people. People who had money and means had to give a lamb. But they didn't have that. They just had two little birds. Because they were broke. All that gold, frankincense, and murder they had, they burned that up trying to live in Egypt for a few years till they got back. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. Serving God is not about trying to get something from God, but it's the overflow that you have. And it's the proof that you support the church that Jesus died to set up. And I don't mean the building, I mean the body. This is not the only place where you can give and give to God. Mm -hmm. It just isn't. This morning, I've been, I've been, it ain't even about all of that. I'm not, I'm not even going to finish that sentence. It is important that you give to, we're going to talk about what, what godly giving looks like. Because it ain't all these lies that people have been telling you. And it took all that time to debunk some of that stuff so you can just be free and breathe 
and walk in freedom and know that you're not cursed. That's why I'll never ask. I don't want to know what's in the offering plate. I don't want to put what in what. I don't want to know. When the need comes up, I don't want you to pull the register and tell me where they do it, so and so and so and so and so. I don't want to know. So what does the Bible say about how we should give money? Let me tell you this quickly. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians 9. Paul is explaining to them what good giving looks like. What a good heart is. What a good occasion is. Paul is asking for, uh, there's a famine in Jerusalem. And Paul is asking the people of Corinth to help support the people who are in Jerusalem, who cannot support themselves. They're believers in Jerusalem, and they are struggling because there's a famine in the land. You'll see that in, um, uh, in 1 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says this, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, the giving money to the people in need in Judea, it's unnecessary for me to even write to you because I know that you are willing. And I boasted about your giving to the Macedonians and Achaia was, I heard, and you were ready a year ago and your zeal stirred up other people's desire to give. Mm -hmm. Verse three says, yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, uh, so, that so you can be ready. So I don't want to send, I don't want the Macedonians to come with me and find you unprepared. Mm -hmm. Now remember, this isn't just saying, make sure the offering plate is overflowing all the time. This is saying there is a need in the body, and we need help meeting that need. Paul says, I love this, in verse 5, he said, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time so they could prepare the gift beforehand, the one that you had already promised, so it's ready as a matter of generosity and not grudging obligation." So Paul says, this is, uh, this is so good to me. Paul says that number, the first thing you ought to do if you want to give right is you give to worthy causes. Because every place you give ain't giving to God. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if, if you're giving to a guy who's got $65 million planes and million dollars of real estate, you're paying whoever he's got mortgages to, not him. And certainly not God. Paul says, I'm not trying to get rich off of this thing. He said, there are people who are in need, and I'm going to help you help them. If you believe in this cause, praise God, it's a worthy one. He says, so I'm sending the brothers ahead of me a couple of days to get whatever money they're going to get, and, and that way when I get there, we ain't even got to talk about it. Because I don't want anybody to say, Paul showed up and set the money lines up, and we wouldn't have given if Paul didn't, didn't make us feel obligated. That's what he says. I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go ahead of time and prepare your generous gift, which had already been promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not of obligation. Paul says, as he goes on, you ought to give to a worthy cause instead of just handing out your money flippantly to some other, because you don't want to, I don't want to do the research and see who really needs it. I just want to give it to church and just be through with it. That's it. God, when are you going to give me my 100% return? <laughs> um, everything we do for Christ including how we give should be to support spreading the gospel and helping the needy don't thoughtlessly hand money to somebody on TV because you think this is God's I think mean, you'll go real crazy when you get to heaven you'll be like I said Benny Hinn that $1,500 faith seed and God be like I don't got that I'm not with him <laughs> That's like going to Publix and saying you took your money to Walmart. That's silly. You get in trouble. For, you'll get in trouble for robbery. <laughs> you'll be robbing Publix. No, I took my stuff to Dollar General. Yeah, we don't get that. What a scribe. <laughs> I'm serious. You gotta have the. We ought to be giving to a worthy cause. I believe New Mount Zion is trying to do that. We have got a ministry that is reaching people all over the world. We don't be trying to do a whole lot that we can't afford. All I, want, I don't want to do is see people come to Jesus. All right. Have no problem being generous as the, as the saints are in need. This is, a, this is a good place to support. We have to support. As I don't be tripping about the stuff that we do to support the ministry. And then you can't, like, how am I going to pay God back for giving me incredible people like you in my life? Right. Don't, cheapen, don't cheapen that by, by thinking it's going to be about money. Give to worthy causes. Um, uh, 
And don't believe people when they say that as you give, you're going to receive some spiritual gift either. You ever seen that? Oh, I hate these. We're going to have an impartation service. If you get in this line, I'm going to place my hand on you and give us all my anointing. I'm not making this up, am I? No. Okay. Acts chapter 9, um, they, uh, the, 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 the disciples are moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, healing people and doing all kinds of miracles. And this sorcerer says, how, how much do I got to give you to, um, how much do I got to give you to get that, uh, that power? And uh, the, the, they said to him, may your money die with you, thinking that you could buy the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want that to be what anybody says about any of us, that we've been trying to get what God has by some means other than worshiping him in spirit and in truth mm -hmm. and being willing vessels, a city set on a hill, doing evangelism, preaching the word in season, out of season. So if you want to give in a way that honors God, give to good causes. Do some research and make sure. Amen. Amen. Give freely without force. Paul says, don't give because you think I, you're going to make me happy. I don't even want to be there when that happens. I'm coming to preach. I'm coming to teach. I'm coming to minister to you. I'm coming to see about y'all and make sure y'all get it together because y'all tripping in Corinth. Remember, they were questioning whether he was even an apostle and all that. All the second Corinthians, he's like, man, I heard y'all been arguing about who's the Apollos or who's the Peter. What's wrong with y'all? I'm going to come and get y'all right. We get the money thing done so we can have church. <laughs> secondary issue give freely without force Paul doesn't see money as a way to advance himself he sees it as a necessary thing to advance the gospel mm -hmm. and that's how we should be seeing it here also the goal of a church is not to get people in here and me to give you a business strategy that's going to make you that's going to blow you up financially overnight because most of those are at the expense of somebody else you're doing an invest in and investing in real estate schemes. Somebody's probably falling into foreclosure and you're profiting from it. Mm -hmm. You're doing this weird banking kind of transactional thing and you're seeing your numbers go up, up, up. There's somebody who's got $1,000 in that thing. Watch theirs go down, down, down. So you can go up, 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 up. <clears throat> Jesus says in Matthew 6 and 19, don't store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal it, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Mm -hmm. So I give to the worthy cause. I give out of gratitude to God. And then the last thing I want you to do is give out of gratitude towards God. What's my motivation? It's not for me to be rich. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the formula was give all you have to God and he'll make you rich, then Jesus and all of his disciples were failures. Because they never got rich. As a matter of fact, all the disciples except for John uh, ended up dying horrible, torturous deaths. Mm -hmm. Jesus told you in this life you have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. He said it earlier, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it wasn't so, I would have told you so. If you think that this is your way to get rich quick, you may. But how do those blessings come to you? When I look at all these folks who are trying to force you to give them money, I have to wonder if those checks are signed from hell. I'm just curious. Because Satan does have some authority and some power. In Matthew chapter 4, he rolled up to Jesus and he said, I'll give you all of this if you just turn away from God and worship me. He'll offer you so much less at a cost that you should never pay. Instead of giving to get something, this is what Paul says, Say this, who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He sows bountifully will reap bountifully. That's just a thing. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not 10% or 20% or 23%. Not giving until it hurts or giving your last penny. Second Corinthians, 
9 and 7 says, Let everyone give as he purposes in his own heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God, for God loves a cheerful giver. Not a pasted on smile while you give your rent money, but a really cheerful giver. Not, I'm trying to impress the pastor because I think that maybe some of that will trickle down on me and I'll be rich because I'm not rich. So I'll be a really bad example for you. <laughs> if you try to, don't study me, you won't graduate. <laughs> I'm telling you, we do it, we do it fine, but I can't. Mm -mm, mm -mm, you don't want that. Uh, God is able to, and this is, this is what a, a gracious giver can expect to receive. 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, mm -hmm. that you always having all sufficiency in all things, that you may have an abundance for every good work. God doesn't, hadn't promised all of us a Rolls Royce. Because I can come to church in my altar just fine. My car is just my get around. Even if you buried me in it, I couldn't take it to heaven. And if I wanted to be buried in it, you'd probably question my, my salvation. He says that God gives you things for every good work. As it is written, verse 9, he's dispersed abroad. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. God doesn't even promise that it's going to come back to you a hundred times the money and more than you got. Money, 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 money. That's a satanic promise. Because for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Yes. <laughs> he says, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them with all men. People of Corinth is doing all right financially. So Paul didn't mind leaning on them and saying, y'all, I'm glad y'all are willing to help because they need what you got. Church should not be a place where broke folk come together to be broke together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and where one person who's standing in the pulpit is doing better than everybody who's looking up at him. I'm preaching this message with the complete understanding that it will never make me rich. <laughs> Having come through and given you an hour worth of this truth, unless you just didn't listen, you will never sit a whole bunch of money in front of me and expect God to bless you. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. Because I am not here because I expect something from God financially, physically. If my heart were there, I wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be right with God anyway. David says in Psalm 51 and 15, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You don't even want a sacrifice or I would give it. He says, you're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice that's pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You won't despise a broken spirit and a humble heart, God. And your good pleasure cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. Whole burnt offerings and bulls will be offered on your altar. God, you can't repay God with stuff when he's given you himself. All right. Why cheapen the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross to be some way for you to take care of your bottom line? Why, would I, why do I need to have so much more than the Son of God has? Don't desecrate God's altar with your cash. The only offering that God accepts for the forgiveness of sin is the blood of a lamb, a spotless lamb. 
John 3 and 14 says it like this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. He says, so everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son to the world to judge the world. But, the, but to save the world through him. You cannot repay God for all that he has done for you. And if you try to, you're breathing God's air, spending the money on the job he gave you. You're, you're, you're setting yourself up for a cycle that never ends. Or the worst, a pyramid scheme where there's some sinful man or woman at the top who's not doing what you're doing. T.D. Jakes don't just trust God if it happens. He gets money from whole folks that make him rich. Hmm. And we want to call that a blessing. I don't think it's one from heaven. Right. At the end of that, as I prepared this message, it pushed me to repent before my God. Because I realized that I had been suckered in by some of that stuff. That my giving had been tainted. That I was giving with an expectation that I was going to get a good return on my gift because I've been trained in prosperity pimping. Hmm. And I thought that I could extort God by giving him this little bit that he even gave me the ability to have. Parents, that's like your children giving you a dollar from the allowance that you gave them. Here go a dollar from the ten dollars you gave me. Can I get a hundred from you? Not only is that a ridiculous proposition for the person who's giving you the money anyway, but you miss out on the fact that you are, that they sitting in your house with your air and your heat, with your electricity, with your water, with your gas, with the food that's in there, with the furniture they didn't pay for, that they are, they are existing in grace and mercy and trying to give you an inferior something to get more when you've already given them everything they need. God has given us his only begotten son, Christ Jesus. We are infinitely in debt to God for our sin. How much money would it take for you to be satisfied if you knew that no matter what, you'd still go to hell? What's your price? I don't have one. If it means that I never get that house, that car, if it means I never, we never, we never have a, a $25 million building, that's fine. Because Jesus didn't die for us to build buildings. He didn't tell us to set up buildings. He came because we had a, a wound we couldn't heal that we caused by our sinfulness. The problem was not that we didn't have enough money. The problem is that we didn't have enough righteousness. Mm. And Jesus paid the ultimate price, his own death for our sins, and he paid it on a cross. And at the end of it, he called the transaction finished. The account settled. And then he charged the disciples after he, you know, he died on that cross. You know he died, right? To the sun of future shine. He died to the, to the earth began to rock and reel. He died until the, the, grind, the, the, the graves gave up their dead. He died. One, one person at the, end of the, at the edge of the cross, a Roman soldier said, surely this man was the son of God. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. Yeah, they can pay for the grave plot. They just borrowed that. <laughs> Telling me he's rich. But he, but, but he was, but he's richer than anyone who's ever lived, not because of what he had physically, because of who he was spiritually. Yeah. He was so rich that death couldn't even hold him down. He was so valuable that the Holy Spirit, three days into it, called him up from the grave bodily. And he walked around and showed people what the grace, mercy, favor, and overflow of God looks like. And it's not something you can put in your pocket. It's the Holy Spirit you yeah. put in your heart. Yeah, He's going back to heaven. He's sitting at God's right hand, 
right now, making intercession for you and for me, that every time we said and thought, word and deed, every time I've given it wrong intent, he said, Daddy, I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. That ain't what he meant. Yeah. Every time I let somebody tell me what the Bible said, and I didn't bother to read it for myself. And I gave him a dollar and told him to give me a hundred and I'm breathing the breath with the body that he formed for me for nothing. He said, Daddy, that ain't what he forgive me. Mate. He's covered in my blood. I'm working on him. He's being sanctified. He's, he ain't there yet. You don't even have to see that because I've lived the perfect life. So if you want to see what, 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 if you want to see him, just look at me. And God honors that sacrifice. Yeah. greatest gift that you can give God is you. All right. The greatest gift you can give God is you. And God supplies seed for the sower. He'll take care of whatever the need is. Amen. Amen. He will. Amen. You know what he said in Matthew 6? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all the stuff you're worried about, all the stuff you're borrowing over, you're mortgaging, you're putting stuff in the offering plate, and you're sowing your seed and laying it in front of, in front of somebody and don't know if it's even getting to God. He said, just seek me. Yes. And my righteousness. Because an unrighteous rich person can't get into heaven. The only righteousness that gets you into heaven Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If, if, if Satan lays all the blessings in the world in front of you, and you die a billionaire without Jesus, you're going to wake up in hell. All right. And eternity is going to look like nothing compared to a life of creature comforts. Over like that, you got eternity separated from a God who loves you and died for you to live. I don't care what this message cost me. <laughs> because to be saved, it cost my Savior everything. And I would rather you know the truth and not live in unnecessary financial struggle, stress, and strain because you think that every, 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 every jerk that tells you give it to me and you're giving it to God is telling you the truth. I don't want you to go through your, through, your, through your life, but certainly through these next few days, through this week, seeing how often someone tries to take advantage of people's greed and fear and concern and poverty and how many times people are waiting to take, 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 and they never really can offer you what God offers you, which is that your sins are paid for. And no currency in the world can do that. That you really will have blessings that never run out. His mercy is new every morning. Amen. Praise his faithfulness. Thank Don't cheapen yourself. The Bible doesn't tell you to. And God is too good for us to be treating him that way. And loving him that way. I'm just telling you what my repentance looks like. And I think that as we consider that. It'll change the way you live. It'll change the way you give. 10% if you want to, whatever you want to give. Whatever you want to give. Make that up between you and God. I trust the Holy Spirit to take care of his work. Mm -hmm. I just do. And if I've got to make you do it, that's me doing it. I don't want that. I don't need that to be on me. I'm not a CEO. I'm a shepherd. So I can't guarantee you this big return, but I can promise you that he meant what he said when he said that I will that I'll take care of your needs if you prioritize me. And I know that to be true. I can testify to that. Amen, somebody? Amen. Consider, just as you go through your, your week, check yourself. Check in with yourself and see if you've been, I got, I got pulled in. Dang. <laughs> but consider, did I ever get rich? Did it ever work for me? Did I name, claim, lab, grab, decree, declare, speak into it? Did it ever happen? He bought another plane. 
And whatever it was that you had could have gone to somebody poor. Could have gone to somebody who couldn't feed themselves. Could have gone to someone who could have gone to a ministry that's really doing gospel work. Not just some fool in a thousand dollar suit on TV. We gotta be better, saints. I believe God's gonna grow this ministry. I believe he is. We're gonna reach people who ain't never been reached. I believe, and I know he's gonna take care of it, which is why we're not trying to do it on credit and trying to put a bunch of burden on people to do it. Because he said if we seek him first, he'll take care of the rest. All right. That's my commitment to you as a pastor, to tell you the truth of the word of God and not put us in a position that we are chasing after stuff that the world has. Controlled by all of that stuff. Because if my, as soon as we fill our bellies, they'll be emptied again. And we'll never have enough. But God gives us his spirit. He told a woman at the well, you'll drink this water one time. You'll never thirst again. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your correction. Thank you for the conviction that comes from hearing from you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. <laughs> we were brought forth in sin, shaping in iniquity. Coming into a world that is sinful. I'm not going to blame it on the world, little Lord, we sinful too. Been tricked and trapped. <laughs> but I pray, Father God, that you would just help us. Even now, cleanse us. You said that if we confess our sins, that you, are, that you are faithful, that you'll cleanse us, that you'll forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. To help us to give with humble hearts, not expecting stuff, but knowing that you'll supply our needs and that you do that because you want to see someone blessed just like we are. Help us not to be caught up in stuff. I pray that this ministry, as it already is, would be focused on seeing people saved coming to know you as their Lord and their Savior. Not in any other thing. Help us not to be in business, but to be a real ministry. That someone can come here in need and find their needs met. But the greatest need that they have is that they know you. So if there's anyone who's listening, even online, who doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today they receive the most valuable gift that the world has ever seen. And that's salvation by grace through faith in you. Help us to be good stewards of these blessings. Make wise decisions for us, Lord God. Help us. I thank you for everyone who was here, Father. And I pray, Lord, that we would be more like you because we have heard the preaching of your word. Lord, we love you, honor you, and praise you. In Jesus' name, let every heart say, Amen. 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 I know I kept you a long time today. Forgive me, y'all. 1222. Jeez. I'm going to do better next week, okay? Amen. <laughs> uh, I'd like to be done by 12. They're going to be looking for me at, uh, at, at Bojangles already. Wonder where I am getting my chicken. Uh, <laughs> so, de uh, deacons, if y'all want to come and, uh, and, and collect, the, collect whatever contribution you have in your heart to make. Don't trip about it. Don't make a thing a thing. Uh, we're going to have a meeting. I know we've been promising you this meeting for I don't know how long. Uh, we're going to do it the first Saturday in February. Okay? The first Saturday in February, we're going to have the church meeting. Let me make sure I got the right time. It'll be right here at 10 o'clock. Everybody cool with 10? Does 10 o'clock work for everybody? Yes. 10? All right. Let's do first, the first Saturday in February at 10 o'clock right here. And we just, we're going to talk about where the church is financially. Spoiler alert, we're really good. Doing just fine. <laughs> we're doing just fine. And looking, I'm, I'm going to be honest, we're looking for more opportunities to bless somebody. So in between now and the beginning of February, if there, if there are organizations, if there are charities, if there are places that you know need some help, have them ready to tell me when we come together on the first Saturday of February. Because we want to be a ministry that's serving people. Amen. The community ought to be better because we're here, not poorer because we're here. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you. Thank you uh, for your son, Jesus, Lord. And we, I want to thank you for these gifts that people have given. Free will, not out of coercion, Father God, but because they love you and want to see your kingdom grow and expand, Lord. So thank you for what they've given. I pray you would increase them the way your word says, in their righteousness. 
that they continue to be able to serve you without restraint. Lord, we love you and honor you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So 10 o'clock, first Sunday of February, we'll, um, we'll be here, have a little business meeting. I'm going to ask for volunteers for stuff. I got a few of y'all in mind to do a few things. I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to put you too much on the spot, but I might just pray for you. Um, and uh, uh, next Sunday, we'll be doing distance. That'll be fifth Sunday, so we'll be here. We're back here on first Sunday in person. Um, Check on somebody if you don't see them in church, you haven't seen them in a while, shoot them a text. You never know, that might be the, the text they're waiting on that's going to save their life. You just never know. I've been that person who's been on the edge and somebody just told me they love me. And it was like, all right, I'm going to do it today. Been there. So you just never know what kind of a blessing you can be to somebody. So please do that. Um, if you're watching online, all the information to contact us is in the description. You'll see it there. Thank you so much to everybody who supports this wonderful ministry. Again, Sister Eleanor is cancer free. Amen. 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 Sister Eleanor is she, she, she is cancer free. Amen. So God is still doing God's stuff. Yes, he is. Amen. All right. So y'all enjoy the rest of your enjoy your Sunday. Uh, there's some good football on this this afternoon, I think. I intend to try to catch a nap so I can so I can see some of it. Amen. 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 All hearts and minds clear. Yeah. Everybody good? That's right. That's right. Amen. Enjoy your Sunday. Love you guys. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs>